Hello fellow Bible geeks. Good morning. Uh, good early morning, I should say. Uh, it is in the six o'clock hour, and so I thought right now would be a great time to take on uh, something incredibly controversial, uh, something that everybody has lots of opinions about, and uh, is responsible for uh, a lot of pastors not getting jobs at particular churches, and that is the doctrine of the second coming. Uh, so we are doing our series here. We continue our series on Surprised by Hope. And uh, the second coming of Jesus is uh, an important part of that book. It's an important part of Christian eschatology uh, as well. And so we are marching our way through. And we've covered the topics of heaven and hell and resurrection. So now we're going to get into some of the really sticky stuff when it comes to uh, what the meaning of Jesus' return is supposed to be. Uh, I've said this before in a few others, uh, a few other videos, and I'm going to say it again now. Uh, if you want to get very confused and very uncomfortable, uh, go Google the Second Coming and just start looking at the videos that pop up or the websites that pop up. I swear these things look like they were made in 1999. Um, the people who have them probably still have AOL email addresses. Um, that was just intended to be funny. But there's a, there's really, really strong uh, views about this and what it means. And and I we need to deconstruct this. Or we need to get to the bottom of what's going on. And so between uh, the book reading, uh, if you're following along with the book, chapters 7 and 8 were what we read for today. Um, we're going to get into some of the biblical data as well. We're going to start with some views on the second coming and some vocabulary. Uh, there's a lot of vocabulary that's being used. I'll cover that in a moment. And then there's three parts I want to look at. I want to look at the ascension and the evidence of the second coming that comes from the ascension. That's also going to be important for some of the later stuff. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, the question of the rapture. Um, you probably know what that means. If you don't, we'll define it. Um, and then we're going to look at the Daniel 7 quotations that Jesus has. The Son of Man coming on the clouds, which is mentioned in uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Uh, and how to understand that in light of the second coming. We'll lean on the surprise by hope reading a lot there. And then why does getting our theology about the second coming straight matter? Um, I think that one's really important. So that's what the five videos are going to be. And I want to start with views in the second coming. Um, like I've indicated, this is perhaps the controversial issue uh, in some circles. In other circles, they don't even think about it. Um, I liked, uh, I was listening to Vody uh talk about this in his video on Revelation chapter 20. Um, I think he's done a tremendous job with the Revelation videos. Uh, and if Bible Geeks ever does a uh, Revelation study, which is something I've thought about, uh, I'll probably lean heavily on his material. Um, but I will quote two parts of that real quick. The first is this uh, quote right here that the topic of the second coming often generates more heat than light. Um, and, you know, as the saying goes, that would be it gets people very fiery. It doesn't get you much anywhere in terms of understanding. I think that's pretty typical. Um, I watched a good amount of YouTube videos uh, on this as well. And boy, there's a lot of garbage out there on this topic. Uh, and the other one is, uh, so that's maybe the light part, the heat part. Uh, he was telling a story about how he was interviewing at a church and there were, um, to paraphrase, there's room for disagreement on the spiritual gifts and to what extent they were active today. Um, the church had a point of view, his point of view, whether it was different or not, didn't matter. There was um, room for disagreement on women in ministry. He was coming from a church that had one view. He was going to a church that had a different view. And they would permit disagreement on that. Uh, the interview was over if he did not say he was uh, premillennial dispensational. Uh, that was it. There was literally no room. You could agree on some of the other highly controversial issues within strains of evangelicalism, uh, such as on the spiritual gifts or women in ministry. Uh, however, there was no room whatsoever for disagreement. There must be a premillennial dispensational 
rapture understanding of eschatology. That was non-negotiable. Uh, so that that point of view exists. Uh, many people do not know uh, that there are multiple opinions on the topics of Jesus' return. Uh, multiple options, I should say. That I'm actually going to change that for later. There are multiple options on the topic of Jesus' return. And a lot of that is because of the heat. Uh, and so I want to give some names to these things. I want to go over the vocabulary. I want to challenge what people who, if you were just a, uh, if you regard yourself as just a regular Christian, you go to church on Sunday, you go to church sometimes, uh, maybe you don't even go to church uh, very often, you don't even regard yourself as a Christian. Uh, I believe, probably because of my own experience, uh, but I think this is validated in listening to how others talk about it as well on uh, these videos I've encountered. There is a meme, this idea that premillennial dispensationalism is the default position. Uh, and um, I'm skipping ahead a bit here, I guess. Um, but when people start using words, millennium, tribulation, rapture, dispensation, church age, uh, gosh, what are the other words? Um, you know, the, the promises to Israel being fulfilled, Antichrist, Gog and Magog, uh, bottomless pit, devil and Satan, and what's going to happen. Like, they, they start rattling these things off. Uh, you get the sense, if you've never looked at it, that they've done their homework. They know things that I don't know. Um, and I, I can't respond to that. Uh, you know, the ab abomination unto desolation and uh, would be another really good one. There's these words, and they use the words, and the words give them power. Because it seems like, wow, I've never looked at this stuff. I don't know what these things mean. I say something about the Seneca coming, and they're like, so wait. But, but don't, don't you understand that there's going to be the rapture before the millennium during the tribulation, and then there's going to be the abomination unto desolation, and then the blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh my gosh. Um, and uh, so people who spend their time thinking about this and have developed an entire vocabulary around it seem like they become the default position. And it gets talked about a lot in contemporary culture, as we'll look at in a second. Um, I want to challenge that and show you that there are multiple ways especially because, in my opinion, so much is made of so little biblical evidence. And we've really got to stop. Uh, differing opinions are bound to occur when there's not that much to go off of. Strong opinions weakly held is going to be a fine position to take here. We need to be charitable in our discussions with people and in disagreements on the second coming. Because... I don't know all the answers, and what's more, you don't either. Uh, you know neither the day nor the hour. <laughs> I'm sure everybody would agree with that. Um, but we've been over this with apocalyptic literature before, uh, and we'll get into this a bit in this um, series as well. People are very sure of things uh, on the Second Coming that they have no right to be so sure about. Um, and in fact, they should just abstract it a bit more and not claim to have or to even uh, be able to get a concrete understanding. So this is my motivation behind the vocabulary and by tackling this topic. Uh, I want to enable people to understand there are different ways of thinking about this and to take Tom Wright's view and I think elevate it a bit and say, for instance, uh, this point of view has a lot to commend to it. Actually, I'm not sure I agree with all of it, and I don't necessarily expect you to as well, um, but I'm much more in that camp. So as we've done, uh, let's take a look at a few of the views of the Second Coming. This here, right here, I've, uh, I've started being a bit more careful uh, on Creative Commons licensing. Uh, so here is a, uh, a drawing of, I think, what a lot of people think uh, the Second Coming involves. You've got Jesus up here. Uh, you've got the kingdom in heaven in the clouds. You've got angels off here with trumpets. And then you've got people being sucked up 
into heaven. They're being sucked away from the world. Uh, so you have the uh, people coming out of the graves. So this is the uh, resurrection. Or, you know, the this is a, an illustration of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, if I had to say that. So he'll come on the clouds with the sound of the trumpets. The dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, and then we... Uh, who are alive will be caught up in the air. So you have some, uh, everybody's going up in the air. You have some people coming out of the cars. Uh, we'll get to the bumper stickers in a second. Uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, this image captures uh, a lot of what people think about what the second coming is supposed to be. Jesus is snatching his people away up into the clouds, literal clouds, literal uh, kingdom, literal trumpets, literal getting pulled out of the graves, sucked into the air. Uh, so the, yeah, the the image of the rapture, and then of course there's the people who are left behind. Uh, the left behind series selling, gosh, over twenty million copies. Uh, the, the series was only supposed to be like a couple books, and they stretched it into like twelve or thirteen. Uh, I actually don't know how many. Twelve would be. Uh, it would be hard for me to think they didn't go with 12, just given the significance of the number in Revelation. Um, but, right, you've got the church is raptured, and then there's people who are left behind for the Great Tribulation. Uh, some of you who may be, uh, may have been around, you know, awake to Christian literature in the 60s and 70s, may uh, be aware of how Lindsay's The Late Great Planet Earth, that was a huge seller. Um, and then for my generation, the Left Behind series is the one that I, is most associated with that. So Nicolas Cage, yes, I'm sure he would be left behind. Uh, that's a joke. But their Christ Church is taken up, and then everybody else is left during you know, this uh, Great Tribulation where meteors are hitting uh, the planet and a third of the population is destroyed and there's plagues and there's all sorts of terrible things happening uh, that then ultimately leads to um, a second return of Christ uh, which we'll get to in a moment I gotta do the bumper stickers love the bumper stickers I mean don't love the bumper stickers but they're funny uh, you, you've got people who you know if I may uh, people buy this stuff and it just, uh, it troubles me. But, so in case of rapture, this vehicle will be unmanned. Um, there is also a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of certainty about one's own salvation within the premillennial dispensational point of view. Uh, so, f for instance, I would never, uh, <laughs> I would never deign to get a bumper sticker this audacious uh, that would make a declaration that I am definitely one of the elect. We are the uh, we are the chosen few. Um, oh, how does that how does that English satire go? Um, there was some Englishman who wrote this thing. Uh, yeah, it was like we are the something in chosen few. Um, oh, now I want to look it up. I am gonna look it up real quick. We are the chosen few. Uh, yeah, we are the pure, we are the pure and chosen few, and all the rest are damned. There's room enough in hell for you. We don't want heaven crammed. Um, so yes, that's uh, <laughs> there's a bit of that going through this. Uh, then of course, you know, just to make sure we are inclusive, uh, some cars will not be unmanned; they will be unwomaned. Uh, so we want to make sure that we've got options for everybody. Uh, then, of course, you have the response. In case of rapture, this car will be safely driven. Uh, I suppose uh, Romans 1 coming to life there. Uh, it's not for lack of knowledge of God. Uh, and then if I had to get one, it would be this one. Warning in case of the rapture, this car will be pulled over rethinking his eschatology. Uh, because if, in fact, there is a rapture of the church, uh, if I am not caught up in that, which I do not regard as a 100% probability, uh, yes, I will pull over and just be like, huh, really? Blast. And then I'm going to turn to James chapter 3 and the thing about false teachers and uh, have a sober moment. So, 
there's this idea in, uh, in uh, rapture theology that you know, Jesus comes back, pulls his people away, others are left behind, uh, great tribulation, and then he comes later, Revelation 19, this is him coming on the clouds, on the white horse, the uh, many crowns on his head, name written uh, that no one knows but himself, and the robe dipped in blood, he's the king of kings, lord of lords, uh, and so here's some uh, drawings depicting that. Some some people think that this is uh, truly actually how it's going to happen. Uh, Jesus and the armies of heaven will come back on the clouds. Uh, he is riding on a horse. If we could at least make it a Pegasus um, so the horse can fly, because after all they are coming on the clouds, that would just make my, my logical sense feel better. All right. So this is, uh, these are views, if you just go do a Google image search of Second Coming, this is what you're going to see. You're also going to see better versions of it, but again, Creative Commons license. So I want to start putting some names to concepts. Let's start getting used to some of these things that are said um, and what they mean. All right, the first, parousia. If you hear the word parousia, it's Greek for coming or presence. Uh, it's used in the New Testament in a few cases to uh, reference Jesus' return. I think it's used 24 times uh, in total, the word, and then 10 times to refer specifically to some eschatological return of Jesus. Uh, it is also used just talking, you know, Paul's writing letters and talking about somebody coming to them. Uh, so it, it is a generic term that has been uh, styled into a proper noun when discussing eschatology, specifically referencing Jesus' return. So parousia, just think, um, if people in these days are using the word parousia, they're referring to the second coming. Okay, so the rapture then, another word uh, from the Latin rapimo, it's a uh, reference to 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up so harpazo uh, would be the Greek word, translated into the uh, Latin Vulgate, rapino. Uh, it would be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So uh, the idea behind it is this snatching. That, that really is the uh, how to understand harpazo, uh, is to be you know, taken away. Uh, so the rapture then, uh, and if anybody's wondering, you know, I've been, I, my cards are on the table here, but that is the meaning of the word. Um, it is entirely right to be thinking of the way that harpazo is used as a snatching. So it refers to the belief that the church will be taken away from the earth at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and then that's going to lead to a time of suffering that ultimately leads to Jesus' return, new heavens and new earth, final judgment. Uh, this is used by the movement started by Darby, uh, John Nelson Darby, um, England and then Ireland in the 1800s, and eventually he uh, made his way to the United States. Uh, so then the millennium. If you hear people talking about the millennium, it's not millennials, that would be me. Uh, the millennium is a reference to Revelation 20, uh, verse 4, which speaks of the martyrs in the Christian faithful reigning with, <laughs> not with Chris, uh, that would be with Christ. For a thousand years, uh, so in fact we can just uh, we can pull this up uh, real quick just so we can probably should just put that there. Okay, and then yep. Yeah. So this whole thing, you know, Revelation chapter twenty through verse four. Um, so I saw the angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the pit. So he's bound for a thousand years, locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more until a thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be let out for a little while. Who knows why? Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and the word of God. 
So those seated on the thrones are given authority to judge, also saw the martyrs. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and received its mark into their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there's this idea that these faithful uh, are reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Boom. Millennium. That's it. Jesus reign along with uh, the faithful for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So when people talk about two resurrections, um, this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. Now, views on the millennium, though, you can see it in that, uh, in that passage. Um, how do I put this? In my opinion, it's awkward to look at angel with a key and a chain and a dragon and to talk about those as symbolic. I mean, is there is it an angel truly holding a key? Going to a door that locks a bottomless pit, unlocks the door the way that you would unlock your front house or we'd unlock a bank vault. And then there's going to be an actual serpent or dragon with a chain, with a chain. And we're going to throw them in there. We're going to shut it. We're going to lock it back up. I think we need to understand how apocalyptic literature is written and read. And I'll refer you to the uh, series on hell uh, where we talk specifically about apocalyptic. We'll talk about it a bit more later. Uh, but the answer is that is not the way the text is intended to be read. All of a sudden, we shift, you know, two sentences later, boom, literal thousand years. Absolutely. How else would you think of it? Uh, so, like, I, I think... There are differing approaches to this. Uh, again, my cards are on the table. I don't claim to be um, unbiased. I am absolutely biased. Uh, I want to be fair. Uh, and so we'll at least go over a uh, what the descriptions of the different points of view are. So millennium itself has some things that need to be decomposed. There's... Three points of view that we'll talk about premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. Amillennialism is what people tend to say, and I don't know why. Uh, we don't say atheist. So, all right, premillennialism. So, the idea of premillennialism is that Jesus will return at the end of the Great Tribulation and assume his throne as the king over the whole world. Therefore, he returns before, hence, premillennial before the millennial reign. So Jesus is going to come back before the millennial reign. This then understands a thousand years literally. Um, you see this as a characteristic of dispensationalism, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, this is a point of view you're going to find commonly in uh, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, Brethren movement. Uh, one thing that I thought was very helpful, if you see the term Bible church, or Bible College, Bible Institute, perhaps. Dwight Moody would say uh, dispensationalist. Um, you, this is uh, dispensationalism. That that word, that is a trigger word. Uh, it, it, or like dog whistle might be a better way of saying it. Uh, because people look at something and say, oh, Bible College. You know, that's a good place because it says Bible in it. And they really believe the Bible. Uh, that phrase right there like Bible Church or Bible College or Bible Institute was uh, appropriated by dispensationalism. It means dispensationalism in almost all contexts. Um, Dallas Theological Seminary as well. Uh, I believe it used to be Evangelical Covenant Seminary or Evangelical Covenant Theological Seminary it changed to Dallas Theological. Uh, that particular seminary is very unabashed in its, uh, very just out in its premillennial dispensational point of view. Uh, that's maybe the m most dedicated think tank for uh, dispensational premillennialism. So premillennialism, you have a couple different uh, points of view. 
uh, the one that most people are familiar with is this one down here, the pre-tribulation dispensational. So the cross here is the start, and I, I pulled these graphics from Wikipedia, though I found almost identical graphics in uh, a book by Charles Ryrie on dispensationalism. Uh, this also is very easily created in Microsoft Paint. But you have the cross, and then between the cross and the rapture, is the age we live in right now. So this is uh, the dispensation of grace, if you're gonna take the dispensational point of view. The rapture then begins the tribulation. So you have the second coming of the church for the rapture, snatched up. Then you have kaboom, and all the bad things happening. Uh, and then you have the second coming with the church. So the, this is then like Revelation 19, Jesus comes back. Um, and then you have the millennial reign of Christ, uh, Satan is bound for a thousand years. Jesus and the martyrs are reigning for a thousand years. Then you have the final judgment at the end of 20, uh, Revelation chapter 20 into 21. Um, and the restoration, new heavens and new earth come at that point. So Christ's return in both of these is before the millennial reign. And then just the question, uh, post-trib, pre-mill, um, is whether or not there is an initial rapture of the church or not. So some people take a premillennial premillennial view. Jesus comes, thousand year reign, after a tribulation, but the tribulation is not marked by a new age uh, that is inaugurated by the rapture, like the initial coming of Christ to take his people away. Um, but yeah, that premillennial, if you want to understand what does premillennial mean, Jesus comes back before the millennium. So there will be a millennial reign in premillennialism, thousand years. Jesus and his people are on the throne, um, and his return happens before that. Postmillennialism is that it, if you've come from a premillennial point of view, postmillennialism is just not going to make sense. You're really going to have to sit with it for a while. I will not do all. I will not do it justice here. Uh, postmillennialism is this idea. Think of it this way. If premillennialism is that everything's going to be getting worse and, worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and then Jesus is going to come and make it all better. Postmillennialism is everything's going to get better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And eventually we're going to hit this golden age where uh, Christian virtues are uh, embodied everywhere. Some people believe, for instance, that like the Jewish people will convert, that there's going to be like a massive global revival that will symbolize the reign of Christ. Um, so this idea of the millennial kingdom where Christ and his you know, martyrs and uh, the people who do not accept the mark of the beast, that's something that doesn't happen uh, it, sort of to borrow Doug Wilson. It's not like the 82nd Airborne gets dropped in. This is a bottom-up sort of idea. There's a brand of post-millennialism uh, called Christian Reconstruction, which is a top-down, like the belief that there needs to be a theonomy, you know, God's law. Um, people might, uh, people would label it, they would blanch at this label, but people would label it uh, theocratic government. Um, but most of the tradition of post-millennialism is that it's this bottom-up revival that starts taking place. Um, so the new heavens and the new earth are, we are in the process of creating that right now. Uh, so since the cross or the destruction of the temple, um, people differ on that. Things are progressively improving and Christianity is spreading and eventually it's going to uh, essentially conquer the world uh, with love. You know, we're, we're not thinking, post-millennialism would not... Uh, under any circumstances, say, use the sword. Uh, but it ends up being the uh, the point of view of the globe itself, and that symbolizes the millennial reign of Christ, after which uh, Jesus will return, as described in Revelation 21, and truly be bodily present here on earth, raise the dead, give us resurrection bodies, transform, uh, you know, complete remodeling, uh, of earth. Uh, but it's a very different point of view. It's a gradual process of things improving and 
it is the work of the church to be bringing that kingdom in. Like that is our eschatological point of view. Uh, this was popular among some theologians like B.B. Warfield, Jonathan Edwards. Um, Postmillennialism, I think, was a um, strong point of view of the American colonists, uh, or sorry, the Puritans. Puritans. Uh, after World War One and Two, postmillennialism saw a dramatic fall off. Uh, people started having a really hard time understanding how postmillennialism could be true if things were getting progressively better and better. How did we just go to war and destroy ourselves um, and our world and create all this, like, in Christendom, all of this devastation occurring? Uh, so postmillennialism went through uh, a huge loss of adherence as well as a lot of doctrinal transformation on the other side of the wars. You don't find many people who would think of themselves as postmillennialists today. There are some prominent postmillennialists. Uh, Doug Wilson is maybe the one I'm thinking of the most. Um, I'm sure Tom Wright would uh, not label himself any sort of millennialist and complain about using millennium to uh, describe uh, eschatology. Uh, but yeah, you, you find this a bit uh, more in the history of the church than you necessarily do right now. Then there's amillennialism, which is, you know, you can look at the graphic here. You got the cross, symbolic millennium, second coming, last judgment. So the millennium is now, essentially. It is a description of the church age, uh, the age between the cross and um, the final judgment. So Jesus is king now. The second coming on the final judgment usher in new creation. But it is... A, is not this idea that things are getting progressively worse and worse and worse and worse, and eventually the uh, the reinforcements get called in, the literal cavalry from the sky, so to speak. Um, and it's not that things will be getting better and better and better and better, and we will be able to watch the church transform the world, and only then will Jesus come back. It's this idea that the millennial kingdom is a description of Jesus' kingship now. So God is king. Jesus is king. He was you know, ascended to the throne. And so now we live on the other side of um, the law. We live in the new covenant. And uh, so this kingdom where Jesus is reigning is, you know, if God is king now over all of the earth, you know, Jesus Christ is the king of kings and Lord of lords, not Caesar, but Jesus is Lord. Uh, that's the description for, like, symbolically the millennium, um, is that. It is the description of that state of things. Um, so this is, uh, I believe this point of view, and you know, if you were to stop your random Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic and ask them, so are you an amillennialist? They would probably say, you know, come again. Uh, like People don't think of themselves using these labels. But the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic Church, um, most, I think, contemporary Reformed people would call themselves amillennialists. Uh, 100 years ago, you would see most Reformed people as postmillennialists. Um, Lutherans, Anglicans, etc. would fall into this, um, this category. So I want to stop just there for just a moment and say that most of the people, most of the number of people in the world... Um, that would call themselves Christians are going to fall into amillennialism. And that's a, because of Roman Catholicism and um, Eastern Orthodoxy. So the idea then that you know, the default position of Christianity is uh, premillennial, dispensational, pre-trib rapture kind of idea, uh, even though it's very popular if you go and read, you know, if you Google uh, if you read Christian blogs, if you look at the literature that gets uh, eaten up quite a lot, uh, it falls into that camp. Most Christians would not be that. Uh, they would fall into a different, uh, different category. So I should define dispensationalism at this point. So dispensationalism, a move begun by John Nelson Darby in the uh, Brethren Movement in the 1830s. And I, want, I put that in there specifically. There's three main points, but... Dispensationalism is new. It's 19th century. 
you you know that I'm sure they would claim that you know the points of view go back to the church fathers, uh, but this label and these ideas are new ideas. Uh, so Darby was in England. Uh, he went to Ireland. He was a clergyman in Ireland. Then decided clergy were like paid clergy were not good things. Um, he started founding these brethren churches in the British Isles, and eventually, uh, even though his ecclesiology didn't catch on in the U.S., his eschatology did. Uh, and so Plymouth Brethren, Plymouth in the United States, Brethren being associated with Darby, uh, that's where you find a lot of the influence in the American church. So three main points to understand about dispensationalism. Darby divides up uh, all of history into seven dispensations. Dispensation just meaning uh, the way that God relates to people. So there's like seven different uh, points in redemptive history where God describes how he's dealing with people. So there's the dispensation of innocence, which was until the fall. The dispensation of conscience. So now we can, during the fall, we have knowledge of good and evil. That goes until Noah. And then God uh, this is going to be very crass, but you no know, changes the rules. Um, or there's a there's a different uh, dispensation of God at towards humans at that point. Um, so then you have human government until Babel. Then God said that's not how we're going to do this anymore. There's the dispensation of promise, so that there will be a restoration, but we don't have the law. Then you have the dispensation of law, which was from Sinai until Jesus. Dispensation of grace, which is from Jesus to the rapture. And then uh, you have from uh, the rapture onwards, this millennial uh, dispensation. So dispensationalism is just the, um, the point of view that, excuse me, you divide up history into these seven you know, punctuated uh, periods. Two other things, Israel and the church are utterly distinct. This is, an um, because dispensationalism, my third bullet point will cover this, thinks of itself as a way of reading the Bible, um, not like a set of beliefs. But if there is a belief that is characteristic of dispensationalism, I, I think these three points are the things that anybody who would call themselves a dispensationalist would agree upon. There are periods of history. They wouldn't all agree on the number, but the classic is seven. Um, Israel and the church are completely distinct. God's covenants with Israel will be kept with Israel. Land and government, for instance, um, so dispensationalism sees a lot of significance in the state of Israel. Um, so why is there why is there this weird evangelical support for the state of Israel? Like people just get really fired up about Israel. Uh, it generally comes from dispensationalism. Uh, why is it like the American South really, really, really supportive of Israel? Uh, dispensationalism. Uh, so the idea here is that Israel... God made promises to Israel, and rather than, as we have talked in Bible Geeks, uh, the church representing Israel, uh, sort of the baton is passed off from Israel to the church. Even I don't even like that. Uh, you know, the church is the true Israel. Romans 9, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Uh, the dispensationalists call that some, uh, replacement theology. Uh, and say God made promises to Israel. God will keep promises to to Israel. Um, those ethnic people, the church, is not Israel in their point of view. Uh, and then the last one: the words of the Bible are to be read as they would commonly be understood by the reader, uh, which has tremendous implications. But it would be something like the Bible says, thousand year reign." So thousand year reign. The Bible says we're going to meet the Lord in the air. So we'll meet the Lord in the air. Uh, it is very much a plain reading uh, of the person at the time. So the, why, do, why am I covering this? To point out that dispensationalism is a late in history development in American theology. Uh, dispensationalism does not really have much of a hold in the British Isles anymore. 
Darby's form of interpretation leads to rapture theology. The rapture marks a key dividing line in his seven dispensations, and if you take his uh, his point of view of you know plain reading, just what would it mean to you if you were to read it right now? Genesis chapter one, the same sort of thing. Well, you know, the order of creation is the order of creation. So we did get, um, you know, day and night uh, before we had the sun. Uh, and, and like, yeah, all, everything associated therewith. Um, th- that form of interpretation leads you to rapture theology. The Schofield Reference Bible, actually, which was one of the first study Bibles uh, published in 1909, took the premillennial dispensational point of view. This really spread the idea in the United States. Uh, I believe Schofield was entirely uh, trying to be helpful. I don't think this was done with any you know, desire to spread cultic propaganda. I really think that Schofield was uh, trying to help provide interpretation of the scripture alongside the scripture, which is something that we see today in study Bibles. People really like their study Bibles for that reason. Um, The first one, if you will, the one that really gained a lot of traction in America in the early 20th century was the Schofield Reference Bible. And this helped uh, proliferate the premillennial dispensational point of view. So when Tom Wright comments that this is an American phenomenon, hopefully this puts it in context. This is the Darby Brethren movement. They have this particular way of reading the scripture. It's not really taken much um, hold elsewhere. A lot of this is because of the Schofield Reference Bible and its popularity in America. So, quick summary. Beliefs about the second coming have a lot of variants. So we may think, and frankly as I used to think, that this rapture, great tribulation theology is the default position of Christianity especially when you see the popularity of things like the Left Behind series. In reality, premillennial dispensationalism is a strain of American Protestantism. Uh, There's some view of it elsewhere, but there are alternatives to the viewpoint. And I would argue there are alternatives to that viewpoint held by the majority of Christians around the world today. So, full disclosure in case this wasn't uh, clear already, but neither our church nor any of the Bible Geeks videos, uh, if Bible Geeks is an institution, neither our church nor Bible Geeks reads the Bible from a dispensational point of view. Uh, I have serious disagreements with uh, the way the dispensationalists read the scriptures. Um, Genesis 1, for instance, I think is you know a dispensationalist perspective They'll focus on you know reading the Bible. They very much emphasize like rightly dividing the scriptures. And when they hear somebody like me talking about it as a temple inauguration, and its parallels with the you know, Ugaritic texts and other ancient Near Eastern uh, cosmogony stories, uh, that just sets off alarm bells. Like no, 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 this is liberalism, or you're bringing things in. You're not reading the text. You're interpreting the text without the text. Stop. It says. Uh, that you know god said let there be light and there was light and it says that the you know there's a vaulted dome and so there's a vaulted dome and uh, like i am i have serious disagreements with that um sermon on the mount also i put on there because there are many strains of dispensationalism i can't claim to know how many people would adhere to this uh i truly don't but there's many strains of dispensationalism that say the especially early dispensationalism i think later dispensationalism many people today would not uh would not adhere to this point of view or would qualify it more than i'm going to say right now but traditional early dispensationalism said acts chapter 2 at pentecost was the beginning of the dispensation of grace that has huge implications because what that does is that puts the Sermon on the Mount squarely in the dispensation of law, not in the dispensation of grace. Jesus' ethical teachings and parables are part of the previous dispensation. So, in the early uh, dispensational attitude, uh, they would say that that belongs to the previous dispensation, not the current dispensation. 
Some people even called ultra dispensationalists put the beginning of the church in Acts 28. So nothing even in Acts is normative. Only the prison epistles are uh, normative for the church. So we keep women out of ministry, but the Sermon on the Mount, you know, whatever. Uh, like it, it's very bizarre. Um, again, I'm editorializing. I claim no unbiased perspective whatsoever. Um, I actually uh, think you can probably detect a lot of frustration with this point of view uh, coming through my my words. Um, but I, I just want I want it to be clear that this is not the way that uh, I read the scriptures. This is not the way our church reads the scriptures. So hopefully by naming this, uh, I spent a lot of time on it. Hopefully by naming this and talking through it, uh, this can jar loose some things that might have felt kind of stuck um, for people who are like, is this really what Christians are supposed to believe? I guess, or I just always thought this is what I was supposed to believe. Uh, that's uh, There are different perspectives, and we are going to get into the biblical data on that in the next few videos. So we're going to look at um, the scriptures on the ascension. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to look at the Son of Man sayings. We're going to see what we can and can't say about the second coming. In case there's any doubt um, at this point, yes, there will be a second coming. Um, it is testified in multiple places in the scriptures. What we can say about it, that's going to be the points of disagreement. So I hope you stick around for that. Thanks so much for watching this longer video. I'm definitely going to have to cut some of this for the class. Uh, but for those of you enduring on YouTube, thank you. Please subscribe. God bless.